Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be uh, across the world. Welcome and thank you for joining us here live today for Serverless Office Hours. And we're streaming live on the AWS Twitch channel and the Serverless Land YouTube channel. Uh, my name is Julian Wood. I'm a developer advocate for Serverless here at AWS. And this week, we are talking all about AWS messaging and events. And I'm super happy to be jo joined by Mandekini Sarup and Adam Wagner. Mandekini and Adam, how on earth are you today? I'm doing good, Julian. Nice to yeah. uh, be here. Thanks for, for having me. It's lovely. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining. And I, I've got to say, we are slightly better geographically spread out over the world this week. We've got, uh, I'm in London, so I'm the furthest east. Adam's in Boston and Mandekini's in Seattle. So at least we are spanning the spanning some things rather than just doing a uh, Seattle uh, East Coast versus, oh, sorry, West Coast versus London. So we're getting there. We're getting there. We'll get someone from Asia soon and then we'll complete the, <laughs> complete the time. So Adam and uh, Mandekini, uh, I you've actually been both been at AWS for I think seven years or something, well nearly seven years, which seems uh, I don't know even if they do things for dog years. You know, one year is seven years. I don't know what Amazon years or AWS years. It must be. Um, but you look you're looking remarkably young, fresh, and healthy uh, for for managing seven years uh, at Amazon. So Mandekini, just yeah, what kind of different things have you been doing? Because I think you joined the Lambda team a year or two ago. Again, time is a vague construct at this moment. But yeah, what, what else have you been doing at, at Amazon up to this point? Yeah, um, so this is actually my second gig in AWS. I did start out my career in AWS. And then I sort of wandered around retail, ops, um, corporate development before circling back. Um, I guess I, AWS just couldn't keep me away. <laughs> Ah, oh, excellent. And you, of course, you fell in love with Lambda, and that's why we... Of course. Uh, <laughs> of course, of course. And you're, and you're a keen skier as well, which is is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, even though I grew, up, I grew up in Cape Town in South Africa, not a lot of snow there. So, yeah, we, we do what we can do. Um, yeah, and yeah. Adam, you've also been around, uh, been around the block at Amazon. What other cool, what cool stuff have you done before you uh, also saw the serverless light? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So I've been here a little while. Uh, I started out as a technical account manager as part of uh, our support organization. Uh, did some really fun stuff there. Helped some of our customers launch some big, high-scale stuff. So that was uh, that was a lot of fun. And then uh, became a solution architect, where you know more of a generalist working across kind of all AWS services. And then I really love serverless and wanted to kind of focus on this area. So recently made the switch to become a serverless specialist, I say. Excellent. Well, that is super great. And so um, uh, Adam is actually going to be getting us, uh, showing us a good demo, which we're going to get into shortly. But also, please remember, we are live. We are taking your questions live. Um, I will attempt, and I've got two amazing guests to fall back on. Um, so we've got a solutions architect and a product manager. So I assure you, anything to do with AWS messaging and events, uh, we got you covered for your questions. Plus, plus, uh, please send them in. And if you don't know, well, we, we tried our best. So just looking back over the last week, Week of serverless. What uh, <clears throat> what happened? Well, last week was a really cool serverless office, office hours episode. We literally sang happy birthday to S to to SQS. <clears throat> Strange thing to do, but yeah, we did it. So we had most of our team together, our developer advocacy team, with restrictions being released a little bit in the United States. Uh, our whole team, a uh, whole United States team, could uh, get together. Uh, Talia Nasi, who you've met on the show before, it's the first time she met the rest of the team. So how cool is that? But I live in London, and uh, Ben Smith, my colleague, lives in Brighton, which is just south of London. So we couldn't travel. So we were actually, we did meet up together, and we were drinking a very tasty beer, watching the happy birthday thing to SQS in a pub in London. So we were part of it, but not quite there. But uh, definitely go and check out the, the YouTube channel, and you can see amazing history of SQS. Uh, Jeff Barr, the chief evangelist for uh, AWS, was there, and he was recounting some really just cool stories of how uh, SQS came to be. And um, I think he even brought up a blog post, which was quite funny, with who, someone had written this uh, crazy new idea, and they'd done an application with the three AWS services. <laughs> Can you imagine nowadays? That would be a, that would be an interesting thing. So yeah, definitely go and check that out. Uh, that was a cool retrospective looking back over the history of SQS. 
So with that, I've got two weeks worth of stuff just to chat about um, uh, what uh, what was um, what is coming up or what, what's been released and what's new in AWS services. I'm not going to go through them all, but just uh, just some quick sort of highlights. There's some Amplify ones which have been, have been coming out. A really cool one I know customers are super excited about is you're now able to import your existing Amazon Cognito user pools and identity pools. And you can now add them um, uh, to your Amplify, Amplify apps to obviously take advantage of the author authorization uh, scenarios and manage them directly from the UI. So that's really cool. Uh, Step Functions has got the Workflow Studio. I love this. Um, it was um, it was shown two weeks ago, and it's uh, on serverless office hours. And this is the new low-code visual workflow designer to be able to, uh, be able to build up your AWS Step Functions within the console, and then you can export them and use them. A really good job by the Step Functions team. Um, from a sort of a streaming kind of thing, uh, Lambda also supports Amazon MQ for Rabbit MQ as an event source. This is a really cool thing. Uh, customers can uh, quickly build applications that are triggered from messages in their Rabbit MQ queue. So if you're not quite aware, uh, Amazon MQ is a managed uh, message broker service, and it supports uh, Apache Active MQ and also Rabbit MQ. And now you can just tie it together with the awesome power that is Lambda. And if you are a Rabbit MQ customer and you're using uh, Apache MQ for Rabbit on AWS, so easy to be able to connect it all together with uh, uh, with uh, Lambda. Um, AWS Amplify has got some cool stuff new with their data store, and this is their local sort of caching mechanism. So front-end developers can build stuff and store things, uh, store the data on device, and this automatically syncs to the syncs to the crowd, uh, syncs to the syncs to the crowd, syncs to the cloud. And so there's some old modes with that. Um, Amplify Flat now supports null safety. Now. Sorry about all you other gurus out there. I had absolutely no idea what this uh, what this sort of meant, so I did have to look it up. And just to let you know, um, uh, Amplify tools are flup, uh, for Flutter to support null safety. It's like null safety. I sort of know what null safety is, but I didn't quite know how this worked with Flutter. But basically, sound uh, having good null safety is a Dart language feature, and this is a way in which code is non-nullable by default, and it turns runtime uh, errors into uh, into edit time analysis errors. And this basically helps you to reduce bugs in your code, and you can benefit from some performance improvements through smaller binaries. So apologies if I all mashed that up and you didn't quite get it, but go and look at the blog post. It'll have a, a far better. <laughs> A far better analysis of this. A uh, NoSQL Workbench for DynamoDB uh, allows you to run more frequent operations, and you can bookmark as many 50 uh, data plane operations. Uh, NoSQL Workbench is a really cool client size tool, and it's got a point and click interface, and it's a really easy way to interact with DynamoDB. Then uh, an interesting one is a uh, solutions implementation for Simple File Manager for EFS, which is Amazon Elastic File Service, sort of NFS in the cloud. And this is a serverless solution, and it provides a user interface for managing data in your EFS file systems. And you can use it to, I think, like uh, browse and upload, da download and delete data from any EFS uh, system in your account. And so you don't actually have to set up or maintain any EC2 instances or any networking to do this. So it becomes a really easy way just to be able to and maybe upload some large machine learning models to EFS uh, via the system, and then you can plug it into your Lambda functions. So then just looking in blog land on recent AWS compute uh, blog posts, um, I just kept this on there in case you missed it. So this is all the serverless stuff that happened in Q2 2021, a whole bunch of amazing blog posts and contents and video series and learning paths and a list serverless office hours as well. So a whole bunch on there. Um, I'm doing a series on well-architected serverless applications. I'll touch on that again shortly. Um, then uh, Sandeep Mahanti has got uh, how to use Amazon S3 Object Lambda. This is really cool, just has Lambda in the S3 get path. You download something from S3, and a Lambda function can run uh, transparently just to do some manipulation on that. Uh, Luca Mesilera has got developing evolutionary architectures with um, AWS Lambda. And this is focuses on how to structure your code for Lambda functions in a modular fashion and how to embrace the evolutionary aspect. And it's provided by this hexagonal architecture pattern, uh, which is fairly interesting. The one on uh, API gateway and private endpoints is how to set up private API gateway endpoints with a Lambda integrate uh, with a Lambda integration, and it allows you to have for on-premises clients can resolve AWS private DNS names. 
Then Lambda States, uh, it's just a sort of, a, Lambda States is basically a capability to track the current state of a Lambda function through its life cycle. It doesn't really normally impact you, but as the Lambda service evolves, there are things we do out of the invoke path. And these are things like when we uh, connect to a VPC, you know, previously it used to be really slow because as, as a Lambda function used to spin up for the first time, we'd create that VPC connection. That no longer happens in the invoke path that's done on the function um, creation or update. Another thing is if you um, package your Lambda functions as container images, we optimize them and cache them close to the Lambda service just to make them super fast. So that kind of stuff happens outside of the invoke path. And so Lambda states is just a way we can track that. And so your, your Lambda function state can be in a pending state while things are happening. And this generally will only impact you if you immediately create a Lambda function and want to, uh, want to invoke it immediately, and it's in the pending state. So it's just a notification and it's also for our partners to update their uh, update their tools. So that's really all on the serverless blog posts. Um, just some um, some series of blog posts that are out there at the moment, which is super useful. James Bezik's done a great one all about streaming data, and this is to do with Kinesis. So if you're interested in Kinesis and Lambda and the power that these two can bring you, um, James Bezik's uh, blog post series is great for you to look at. Um, if you're a new person looking to get started into uh, serverless and you're a developer and used to coding in your IDE, this Getting Started Guide is super helpful for you by Ben Smith. Um, there's a QR code. I'll also, when I got a chance, I'll pop these in, into the chat as well so you don't have to type them out. Uh, and then my one, just being slightly self-serving, I've been doing a whole series on building well-architected serverless applications. Uh, the well-architected framework has a serverless lens with some particular questions to ask yourself uh, whether you are building best practices into building your serverless applications. And so I'm literally covering every single question within the serverless lens and hopefully uh, bringing it to life, um, uh, providing some context, uh, explaining some things so beginners don't feel left out, uh, providing some cool um, advanced uh, um, features and information for people who really know how to use our serverless services. So yeah, this, is, this covers a whole bunch of stuff. So if you're interested in taking your serverless applications to the next level and running them in production and wanting to run them well architected, this is the blog series for you. Serverless Patterns Collection is really cool. These are all snippets of infrastructure as code, either in AWS SAM or via the CDK. You can go to this website, find the two integration points, copy and paste the code, uh, which is the integration stuff in your SAM templates, and off you go. We're, in fact, going to have a whole um, episode on the Patterns Collection soon. But that's the last week. Let's look ahead to this week. And we have uh, AWS messaging and events. And today it is all about AWS Lambda with Amazon MSK. Now, I could describe what MSK is, but we have far better experts um, um, on the stream talking about it. So um, over to you, Adam. Let's uh, tell us all about AWS Lambda with Amazon MSK. All right. Sounds good. Uh, let me share my screen here. Um, I can, uh, I'll talk through uh, a few slides, um, won't, won't spend too long on the slides, and then, uh, and then we can jump into a demo, uh, you know, look at a little bit of code, and uh, get going. Oops. Swap Sounds out. great. So you, yep, yeah, your, um, your, uh, your screen is streaming. All right. All right. We got the, got the streaming stuff uh, going here. All right. So, so, uh, you know, here to talk about, uh, you know, serverless uh, in conjunction with streaming data and specifically today going to talk about managed streaming for uh, Apache Kafka, which is a mouthful. So we tend to just say MSK uh, and how you can use that with Lambda. Uh, so, you know, as a, as a little bit of, a, of an introduction, like, you know, what's, what's streaming data? Uh, you know, it tends to be data that's, that's pretty high volume, continuously coming in ordered and often wants to be processed low latency, though, though not always. Uh, the, the ordered part is uh, kind of a, a big part of what makes uh, a data stream a data stream. And very often, um, you know, I get the question of like, what's the difference between streaming data and and messages, right? Um, are they the same thing? Are they different? And, and I tend to think of messages as, you know, a single message being an important piece, whereas streaming data, it tends to be the type of data where what really matters is 
the data or as a whole or the data over a sliding window. So think about an IoT device that measures temperature or measures mechanical strain on uh, you know part of an airplane, something like that. It's not necessarily like one piece of data that matters. It's the the data over uh, a set amount of time. So hopefully that that helps give a little intro on kind of what streaming data is. Um, Adam, I love that. I, I think that's a, such a. That's, I've been noodling around with this in my head before today. Even yeah, how do we explain the difference between streaming and messages and queuing and notifications and all this kind of thing? <clears throat> so I really, I really like that. I like the audit incremental and yeah that. Streaming is all about collections of data rather than a single one. I'm going to definitely, definitely nick that for uh, f uh, for another kind of thing. And also, I suppose things like you know log events. That's often the you know use case for streaming, where one single line uh, in a log may be important for troubleshooting, but actually you want all the logs. And uh, totally. so, oh, I love that. I'm definitely going to be use that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Another another good example where that like the the fact that it's a collection of events, you know, kind of matters. You think about. Uh, you know, looking at clickstream events from a website to kind of understand user behavior, looking at a single click really doesn't tell you much about, you know, user behavior. But if I look at a whole set of clicks from the same user, now I understand like, oh, you know, they started on this article and then they moved to here and then they moved to here, right? You you understand it a lot more. So yeah, yeah, that that kind of that the collection mattering, I think, is a uh, is a key part of of where streaming data often uh, often plays in. Um, so then, you know, streaming data and kind of like how it fits in a larger kind of application uh, standpoint. You know, very often streaming data gets used in in real time analytics of some sort. Um, so you could imagine, um, you know, advertising and kind of bidding on basically real-time advertising, depending on, you know, who's looking at uh, what on your website and, you know, what they're clicking on. You could be taking in, you know, that data from devices. It comes into the stream. It's stored in some, you know, stream sort, uh, storage that, again, keeps that, that order. Uh, very often, stream storage systems have uh, the ability to keep a certain amount of data for a certain amount of time, right? Often kind of the value of this data over time, at least in the streaming format, kind of decreases, right? You very often want to do stuff in real time with it. Maybe one of the things that you do with it is, is archive it for like later, you know, batch analytics. But, uh, you know, in terms of while it's in the stream, you generally want to do stream processing to kind of do that, that analytics. And so, you know that that ability to kind of do things quickly is is kind of key here, um, and so you know just kind of plugging in a, a couple services here. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, different options that you can use uh, to store streaming data on on AWS. So there's MSK. There's also you know you mentioned uh, James Besick's uh, you know Lambda streaming with Kinesis blog series. Kinesis is another uh, managed streaming option on AWS. Um, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about MSK today, but if people have questions about the two, we can we can definitely try to try to answer that. Um, so you know, MSK at uh, at its core is taking open source uh, uh, Apache Kafka and managing all the kind of underlying hardware for you, getting rid of that undifferentiated heavy lifting of you know managing the servers and making it much quicker for you to have that streaming system up and running. And if you're going to go you know, partway kind of managed, might as well go all the way managed and have Lambda do the processing of MSK. Um, so you know, that's, that's really what we're going to kind of focus on talking about today. Um, a few use cases where you might employ you know, something like this. You know, we talked about some of these already, right? Like real-time web or log analytics. Um, IoT device data is a, a pretty common one. Uh, you know, streaming ETL, sometimes people are ingesting logs through through Kafka or Kinesis as well. So, um, you know, all good, good use cases there. And then if we're going to process those, you might as well do it in a, in a serverless manner. I think most people uh, kind of tuning into serverless office hours probably know, um, you know, these basics. But in terms of, you know, kind of specific to stream processing, 
I think stream processing is one of the just best use cases for Lambda. Uh, partially just the scaling side of it, but also when you do stream processing in Lambda, whether it's uh, processing in MSK or processing in Kinesis, all of that side of stream processing where you're polling the stream storage, keeping track of where you've read, you know, batching up the items to, to work on them, all of that is managed for you. Uh, and so I, I think that's really one of the biggest pieces, which really comes down to that last one, like write less code, right? You, you just don't have to do uh, as much of that uh, kind of boilerplate-ish, uh, you know, polling code to, to kind of get the, the messages off there. They're just delivered straight to your function. Yeah, that's such a great uh, thing to bring up because basically under the hood, Lambda is running a whole fleet of uh, <coughs> compute uh, to uh, to pull these various services. And so if you had to think if you were running your own EC2 instances or even containers to pull and you need to do retries and back off and jitter and exponential back off and all this kind of thing, that's a lot of infrastructure just to get that, uh, just to get that stream to your code. Uh, Lambda can look after that. It is, I won't say infinitely uh, scalable, but pretty impressively scalable. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, Julian, any any questions so far? Yeah, that I can well, help something answer? you alluded to before, Alpha Code. Thanks for the question. Yeah, why? When one? When would one use MSK versus Kinesis? Yeah, MSK versus Kinesis is is an interesting one. Um, so there there are a, a few few different pieces to that. Um, so you know, one reason to go with MSK is really the ecosystem that's built up around Kafka. Um, so Kafka has a, a lot of different connectors, a lot of different big data processing frameworks that have, you know, really well trod libraries get used by a lot of people to process streaming data. Um, so sometimes it's kind of like a tool set uh, thing. Sometimes it's uh, it's basically just being able to kind of lift and shift a uh, streaming workload from on-prem or from somewhere else into AWS. You might already be using Kafka and, and come in there. Um, so you know those are some reasons that that you might want to use um, MSK. Uh, Kinesis is is nice. It has uh, I'll say it has um, you know while MSK is managed, I think. Kinesis is kind of like a, another level of managed, right? There's there's sort of even less to think about. There's just really one scaling knob in Kinesis, uh, whereas there's there's sort of a couple. There's some stuff you might have to tweak in MSK. Um, so I do think if you're kind of starting from the ground up, in my opinion, Kinesis is a little bit simpler to to get going with. That said, it's not not that hard to get started with with MSK uh, either. So yeah, those are those are some of the reasons why you might go MSK versus Kinesis. Excellent, thank you. Alpa Codes did have another question, which you answered. You know, is that a good uh, pathway? I suppose an existing Kafka investment to MSK, otherwise Kinesis. So you answered that. So that uh, uh, that is great. And um, we do have some. Uh, just questions with, to do with concurrencies and limits and all that kind of thing, but I'm just, we will get to them, but I'm just going to pause on that because I know um, Adam's got some stuff to show already. <clears throat> cool, cool, yeah. I'll, I'll go a little further, but yeah, feel free to jump in, Julian, if there's there's things you think I should uh, should cover. Um, so so let's, uh, let's dive a little further into, you know, MSK. Um, you know, MSK is, uh, it, it's, like I said, it's fully managed, highly available, can kind of decide how many AZs you deploy it across, but you know, new, normal uh, production deployment would be across you know three AZs. Um, all the the bells and whistles that you sort of expect to be there are there. So encryption at rest, encryption in transit. Um, you know, really pretty ready for for enterprise use. When you plug it into Lambda. Right, it is uh, you know fits into that third category of of poll based uh, invocation models. Um, so, you know, for for just a, a review or for people that aren't familiar, there's different ways to invoke a lambda function. Uh, you know, the the first way is synchronous, right? So we are invoking the lambda function and waiting for the response, right? Blocking on the response. This, uh, you know, the example of, of when this gets used is with the API gateway, right? So um, API gateway waits for that response and then gives it back to the, the API caller. 
uh, asynchronous, right? So here, Lambda function fires off, uh, you know, kind of cues the event internally for processing and responds immediately that it's got the event and that it will invoke your Lambda function, but it doesn't wait to respond to uh, the, the caller of Lambda before uh, invoking, right? So SNS and, and S3 use this model. And then the last is this poll-based model. So in this poll-based model, and this is something I talked about earlier, the Lambda service is taking care of figuring out what the changes are that have happened uh, you know, since you, you kind of last uh, read from that event source. And then the Lambda service invokes your function synchronously. So that's important just in terms of uh, with asynchronous Lambda invocations, you have things like, uh, like failure destinations that you don't have with uh, asynchronous uh, execution. So that's just important to keep in mind when you think about kind of error handling and, and that sort of thing. And we'll talk about that more with, uh, with MSK uh, in, in a little bit. Um, so this is just showing, you know, a little more detail in terms of, you know, what it looks like when uh, you hook up a Lambda function to MSK. So again, the Lambda service is running that polar. And that polar is polling for new messages uh, on your topic, right? So uh, uh, topic is, is, you know, a specific kind of channel uh, within a Kafka cluster. So a single Kafka cluster can have many topics, right? And uh, when you hook up a, a Lambda function to uh, Kinesis, that's what you're, you're connecting it to is a specific topic. Um, and so the polar is checking that topic for the latest messages. It then invokes your Lambda function. If your Lambda function invokes successfully, uh, responds successfully, then the Lambda polar moves the, the marker of where it's read, the checkpoint of where it's read in that topic, and then takes another batch and uh, and invokes it again. Um, they got a little JSON here to, to just show what the uh, event looks like. Um, so, you know, as, uh, as Lambda function polls could give you if the, the stream is, is kind of being slow, not a lot of records in there. You could just get a single record or you could get um, you know, a, a big batch of records. The batch size is configurable. The, I should say the maximum batch size is configurable. Um, the default is 100 messages, but you can raise it up to 10,000. Um, keep in mind that is a, is a maximum, right? So it doesn't mean you're always, if you set it to 200, it doesn't mean you're always gonna get 200. That's the maximum. If the, the stream isn't very busy, MSK will pull that stream. It could give you a smaller uh, batch of messages. Within uh, a topic, there are multiple partitions. This is uh, kind of how uh, Kafka scales, right? Is that the kind of number of partitions you give it is sort of uh, related to, to throughput. Um, and so uh, the Lambda polar, when you start uh, a new event source, it starts with uh, a single concurrent Lambda function, and it can grow over time to go potentially all the way up to um, the, the number of partitions that you have. Um, and that, that ramping up of that scaling happens uh, every 15 minutes. The, the reason that it wouldn't go beyond that number of partitions is partitions is also uh, part of how Kafka guarantees uh, the ordering of messages. So you you have this uh, the, in streaming data very often to get scale, you need to have kind of multiple consumers reading off of the stream at once, but you often want to do in order processing as well. And so the way uh, that Kafka handles this is you give each message a key and that key is hashed and placed into a partition according to that hash. So if you send in records that have the same key, then you'll get uh, them in the same partition. And that way, you know, you'll get them processed in order. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that 
that uh, helps with that. Um, the the other piece that I'll mention in terms of the ramping up, the polar ramping up the, the number of functions, the way it does that is by looking at the consumer lag, um, which I think is a, is a funny term. It like makes me think of people shopping very slowly is what consumer lag sounds like to me. Um, but, but anyway, um, consumer lag is basically it's looking at how far behind the latest point in the stream, the newest messages in the stream, it's processing. So if your Lambda is keeping up with a concurrency of one or some other level of concurrency, then the Lambda service is gonna keep that concurrency the same because you're caught up. You're like, you're processing the messages basically in real time. If that level of concurrency in that Lambda function isn't enough to be keeping up with the data on the stream, you could get behind. So you start getting 500 milliseconds, 2000 milliseconds further and further behind the latest messages in the stream, then the Lambda service is gonna ramp up that concurrency to try to bring that consumer lag back down. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. I feel like uh, when I started learning about this stuff, that took a, a few few times to to sink in, but but hopefully that helped. So is, is that slightly different then from Kinesis, which does have a one to one mapping between a lambda function and a shard? Um, MSK is only going to ramp up sort of if it needs to. Correct. Yeah. So so lambda with Kinesis, you're right. So there's a, a one to one mapping of uh, basically concurrent lambda functions to Kinesis shards. That, that doesn't mean that you always see uh, concurrency on your function that equals that, but that's sort of the, that concurrency is there if all the shards are busy, right? So if a Kinesis stream isn't overly busy, you might not always have data in all the shards, but if it is busy, you got data in all the shards, you're gonna have basically one concurrent Lambda function um, processing each shard. So that is, yeah, a, a difference between kind of the way the Lambda integration works with MSK versus um, versus with uh, Kafka. So it was, uh, just some of the kind of options here in terms of uh, the parameters when you create that MSK um, event source. So I, I mentioned that batch size, you know, whether or not it's enabled, so you can enable or disable it. Um, the, the pieces that I'll point out now, and then we can kind of talk about these uh, later, are um, the source access configuration, right? So, um, you know, there's a couple of different uh, authentication mechanisms that you can choose for an MSK cluster. And depending on what you choose, you, uh, you, there's kind of two that are supported by the Lambda integration and require you to, to do a few things depending on, on kind of what you're looking at there. Um, a quick comparison in terms of uh, the, the feature parity between the Kinesis event source and the, the MSK event source. Um, so you can see there, you know, the integration with MSK is, is newer than the Kinesis one. So there's a bunch more features on the, the Kinesis um, uh, event source. So, you know, if you see, see something there that, uh, you know, you have a really good use case for with MSK where you'd like to see one of these uh, features, you know, Amanda Keeney's from the, from the product team. So you can put it in the chat. There's a good chance she'll see it. Uh, but, you know, definitely, um, definitely just things to, to kind of keep in mind there. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, is is an important thing to keep in mind and, and something that I've seen some customers stumble with when they're first setting up this integration is uh, is basically like the, the MSK to Lambda connectivity, right? And so uh, these are basically the, the three options you have in terms of configuring Lambda to talk with MSK uh, depending on basically like the network config of MSK. Uh, so the first one is, is kind of the easiest, but also probably the one that people are least likely to do, which is uh, MSK in a public subnet, right? So MSK in a public subnet, you can just 
set up the Lambda integration without any further thinking about things, away it goes, you're good. MSK in a, a private subnet, uh, you kind of have two options, right? So if MSK is in a private subnet, but that subnet has a route to a NAT gateway, then that works. It can use that NAT gateway to talk out to Lambda, you're, you're ready to go. If you don't have uh, a NAT gateway or don't want a NAT gateway and MSK is in a private subnet, can totally do that. You just need to make sure that uh, you have uh, uh, endpoints in that VPC configured for Lambda, Secrets Manager, and STS. Um, so as long as those are there, that'll work. Um, somewhat related to that, the uh, the supported access control methods. So there's a few different access control methods for MSK. The two that are supported are, are no authentication uh, and then the, the SASL scram authentication. If you use that SASL scram, it's gonna use a secrets manager integration, which is why you see on the right-hand side, the uh, execution role and the fact that it needs, um, you know, these three extra permissions if you're gonna use that that SASL scram integration. So let's uh, let's take uh, uh, take a, a moment to talk about kind of error handling real here, uh, real quick. Um, so you know the, we talked about how messages from each partition are uh, retrieved and handled sequentially. So that retrieval and handling sequentially, part of what that means is that. Um, if your Lambda function fails, your Lambda is gonna retry that whole batch. And it continues to retry that whole batch until the processing either succeeds or the messages expire out of MSK. But that could be a really long time. Uh, so the, the best practice here is really to write your code in such a way that you catch any errors and log them uh, and you know this is partially because you know, today we don't have the controls that you have in Kinesis in terms of uh, kind of customizing that retry configuration and having like a dead letter queue failure destination. Those aren't in place today. So really the kind of right thing to do is just log those error messages uh, to CloudWatch and then return success. And then the you know stream processing continues on with uh, with another another function. So um, important to to keep that in mind in terms of uh, in terms of error handling. Um, and that's that's really all I had from a uh, you know slides standpoint. I didn't want to want to bore you with PowerPoint too much. Um, there's a, a couple of um, uh, a couple of resources here to to kind of get started with and. Uh, maybe Julian can can paste those links too, um, but happy to answer any other questions, and then uh, you know can also dive into a, a demo here. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, thanks for that. I, I love getting this sort of big overview picture. It really helps with um, uh, yeah with explaining uh, with explaining what it is. Just some technical ones. Thanks for the tech guy twenty one. Does the polar? And this is when you were talking about the lambda polar. Does this maintain the offsets? And I'm presuming that is yes, because that that was that uh, the number from most recent that it was um, that that it was tracking. Correct. Yeah. So the the lambda polar is keeping track of of those offsets um, and. And yeah, when you successfully return, it moves that that offset to to make sure that it moves on to the next set of records. Excellent. And the other one is about the integration with Lambda and uh, with streaming. The Lambda concurrencies limit would that have any issues? Because the soft limit is one k. So should we raise a limit request? I've got my thoughts on that. I just want to hear what you uh, what you would say initially. Yeah, it, it, it really depends on your specific application. You know, the the you can you can process quite a quite a hefty stream with uh, before you get anywhere near that that thousand. But if you do find that you're getting near that that limit, um, definitely raise a support request to to get that that raised. Uh, always recommend to customers that they you know set some alarms on uh, the 
kind of account level concurrency just to to make sure you keep an eye on that um, and and do raise it up if it's if it's um, if you're getting near it right because it is at the account level as well kind of at the account region level so if you had you know multiple different lambdas consuming from and writing two different topics right you need to kind of keep track of the big picture as well as you know any individual lambdas that are really starting to scale up yeah, definitely. And that's, you know, that's what I was going to add as well, that uh, the Lambda concurrency is pooled, is a shared resource within a account and a region. Uh, so yes, if you've got some other busy applications doing that kind of thing, that's the one thing you need to uh, take care of. But then also remember with uh, Kinesis and MSK, you are batching up these records. So it's not as though you're using a single Lambda invocation to for a single record. Um, I think you mentioned earlier, it's what defaults 100 or 300, but could be up to 10,000. So obviously it depends how quick your Lambda function would process 10,000 requests. But uh, I mean, e even then, if you if you were just thinking of it, if you had a thousand concurrent Lambda functions with each Lambda function processing 10,000 records, uh, yeah, you're getting some pretty high, uh, pre pretty high throughput there already. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And then Sahil, thanks again for your question. Is there any, is there a concept of long polling here? No, no, not, not so much, right? So, um, you know, I think if uh, if people are kind of new to long polling, you know, get, give it a give it a Google to kind of understand that piece. But um, you know, here the the Lambda service is really just kind of polling on a on a regular interval there. Um, and, but again, the the beauty of it is is you don't have to worry about or pay for the resources that that do that polling. Um, so it just takes care of it for you. Yeah, exactly. That's part of one of the benefits of using a serverless uh, service. <clears throat> Long polling is something you need to manage if you're running a fleet of EC2 instances to make sure that you're using your <clears throat> your connections efficiently. But you know what? Uh, Adam's done a great job explaining how the polling works. But the cool thing is you don't need to care about it. Uh, right. You know, the Lambda fleet behind the scenes just sorts that out. If our connections are not efficient or whatever, that's up to us to sort that out. So yeah, that's one of the cool things. Things like long, long polling and you know uh, TCP connections and all those kind of things you don't need to worry about. <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. Well, cool. I mean, the only other quick question we just I just had was about MSK versus SQS, and I think uh, you know going going back to the beginning, different use cases. MSK is for large amounts of data streaming, large amounts of data when it's a collection of data that you need. Uh, SQS, if you're talking about individual messages, it's also placing things on a queue. Uh, it's going to be then asynchronously processed uh, processed from that. What I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to pop into the chat. There is a, a tech talk I actually did last year called Events Queue topics and streams in your serverless application and how to pick the right serverless application pattern. Um, somebody did ask for a blog post uh, about that. I couldn't just quickly find a blog post, but I know I had done a tech talk on that. So this does go through um, some of the different things you need to think about um, for the various services. Yeah, that's a, that's a great tech talk. The, the, other, the other thing to always think about with streaming data, true with both you know, MSK or Kinesis, is that reading the data off the stream, whether with a Lambda function or with some other method, does not affect that data, right? Once the data is written into the stream, it's basically immutable until it expires off the stream. Whereas SQS, you know, the, the whole concept of a queue really is like one message, you put a message on and you're trying to get that message processed like exactly once by basically, you know, one consuming application. With MSK, you know, I, I'm going to show one Lambda function, uh, you know, reading from this, uh, being triggered by this one topic. But you could have five different Lambda functions triggered from the same topic. You could also be reading it with, you know, some other application, right? So very often with streaming data, you can have multiple consumers of that same data. Yeah, oh, that's a great thing. I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because there there are so many important use cases where you think of these services as being a sort of connective glue between various kind of things, and people often forget about the actual storage nature of the service. And SQS as well, in a different way, and Kinesis slash MSK are also data stores, and those messages sit there for a while. And the great thing is. 
if you've got a downstream service that your lamb, maybe your Lambda function is pulling something off MSK and needs to put it into a database. Um, if there's some problem on that database, or you need to even take that database down for maintenance, it's maybe it's not a cloud native database, and you need to shut it down for a for a period of time, those messages are just going to build up in the queue. As soon as that data, as soon as that database comes back uh, alive, you can adjust your Lambda function, maybe you're using something, uh, you know, turning off your concurrency or something. And all it's going to do is just pick up where it left off. That's a great way to be able to sort of store and persistently keep those messages alive. And as uh, as Adam says, um, yes, you can have multiple consumers. So you could use, you know, have very different applications consuming this data. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, cool. Well, so uh, here, you know, I didn't I didn't want to do the uh, provisioning of uh, an MSK cluster live because it does just you know take a few minutes. So I figured I'd stand one up first. So uh, I have a, a cluster here with three brokers. So you can think of brokers as the nodes that are you know storing that data that is in that topic responding to the requests, all that sort of stuff. Uh, Kafka also requires Zookeeper in the background. We spin that up for you, manage that for you. You don't have to worry about it. But you do have uh, connection information for the, the Zookeeper connection. So that is there uh, for you to be used um, You know, for uh, things like creating um, uh, sorry, like getting information about the brokers, querying that information, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, you use Zookeeper for that. Uh, various integrations use the Zookeeper connection as well. So, you know, it's there. Um, there's some great, uh, there's a great page in the docs, I can find it uh, later, that talks about the different kind of uh, uh, Kafka plugins, tools, and kind of which ones work. Uh, with MSK and which ones don't. The, the good news is the vast majority of them do work. The only ones that don't work is there are some plugins that require you to like install a, a, an additional jar. Anything that ins requires that, like installing an additional jar isn't supported, but pretty much everything else is. There's uh, a lot of different, um, you know, kind of plugins and, and things that you can use for it. Um, it MSK clusters have this cluster configuration. Um, I think of it as sort of like the MSK version of uh, parameter groups for RDS databases, right? So um, a lot of the time you can use the defaults, but you know if you're doing something interesting, take a look at it. Um, and and there's uh, a lot you can change there. You know, networking wise, right? So I have this set up across three availability zones, so three different subnets there, and then you can assign uh, a security group. These are my different brokers. Um, storage is one of the kind of scaling factors with MSK. So um, I've just configured it with static storage, 100 gig EBS volume for each broker. There is an auto scaling for storage option where it takes care of that storage scaling for you. Um, so uh, that storage is one side of the scaling equation. The other side of the scaling equation is just compute nodes, right? Those brokers. In my case, I'm using T3 instances. Those are good for you know small workloads, dev tests, things like that. Most bigger production workloads, you're gonna go with a, a larger node size and you have that choice of kind of what node size to go with, but then also how many nodes, right? And so um, you can, can grow those as well. Um, Access control in my case, you know, I have it in uh, private subnets, but that's that's really the only um, only thing I'm doing there. And then uh, encryption is uh, enabled, you know, both within the cr cluster and within the clients and the broker. And then uh, your data is encrypted at rest as well. Um, so that's a little overview of the the MSK cluster. Um, and then I have a. Uh, I have an EC2 instance sitting in the same subnet as it, um, just kind of pumping some data in there. Um, you know, I was uh, I was trying to think of like uh, a fun uh, use case to kind of think about this. I really like riding bikes. Uh, Tour de France is happening right now, but there's a, another sort of race called the Tour Divide, where people ride from Banff, Canada, on mountain bike trails all the way to the Mexico border, um, and uh, 
you know, there's there's all these websites that allow you to do kind of live tracking of them. So this is like my my fake data of riders moving along the tour uh, uh, tour divide and and putting up GPS coordinates of of kind of where they are. And so that's pumping in there, um, you know, to the to the cluster. And then um, and then I've created a lambda function here. Let's go over and talk about kind of how that was created. Where's my VS code window? It's around here somewhere. There we go. All right, so um, so I built the Lambda function using uh, the serverless application module, Sam, uh, Sam the Squirrel, for, for those that, that aren't familiar, um, is uh, basically an extension to CloudFormation that makes uh, writing uh, serverless infrastructure as code uh, even easier. Um, so here's the, the template. Um, yeah, 25 lines. Um, so you know, this basically just tells it that it's SAM. Uh, I have a global section where I'm setting the function timeout to 12 seconds. Hopefully, we don't need that long. Uh, and then I'm creating the MSK function to, to process the data, uh, showing it where the code is. Uh, you know what the the handler is pointed to uh, runtime. In my case, I'm using Python, and then here is the event source configuration. So uh, you know the type is MSK, and then there's just a few properties. So basically, the the starting position. So we support latest and trim horizon, and so this is like when you first create this event source mapping. This is telling it where in the stream you want it to start reading. So latest, as you could imagine, is basically saying, hey, grab me the latest data and let's start from there. Trim Horizon is saying the opposite. Trim Horizon says, go to the oldest data that is eventually going to be trimmed off the stream and start from there and read all the way up until now. So um, you know, tr Trim Horizon, if you expect to be setting this up and get you know brand new, fresh data, do latest, not trim horizon. So just keep in mind what those mean. Um, and then the the stream. So this is you know the ARN for my cluster. Um, and then right below it, you see the topic. Important to realize that with the, the event source mapping, the topic you can't change that after the fact with the MSK event source mapping. So you'd have to delete it and recreate it to change what topic you're reading from. Um, so not, not a big deal most of the time, but just wanted to call it out. Um, and then there's a, a nice managed policy that gives all of the um, standard, you know, Lambda talking to CloudWatch for logging type of permissions, but then also adds in uh, the, the necessary MSK roles. Oh, managed policies are just so brilliant in Sam. Love them. Right? One line, done. <laughs> One line, done. That's like. Yeah, it's it's really nice. So it um, definitely definitely love that part about Sam. Works well. Um, so let's take a quick look at the code here. Um, so here is my handler, right? So the event comes in, and that event can have multiple can have data from multiple partitions in it. If it has data from multiple partitions it kind of segments it within the JSON, right? So you'll have like, you know, partition one, here are the records from partition one, partition two, here are the records from partition two. Um, and so I'm looping through the different partitions, and then I'm also looping through the records it sent me from within those partitions. And then I'm so getting it's a, all so it's a batch. It's a batch, a batch within a batch, and that's also how you can therefore maintain your ordering within a partition. Exactly, exactly, right? So uh, that's that's how that, that ordering gets maintained. Um, you know, earlier we talked about the error processing, right? And how with MSK, that with that integration, if it errors, it's gonna keep trying, gonna keep trying, gonna keep trying. So I have a try-catch loop around all my, my data processing here. And if I error, I'm gonna print it out to the log and I'm going to return success. So the good news is it's going to keep processing, hopefully, no matter what. 
the the thing that that does mean though is you have to monitor your logs and look for those errors because those errors aren't going to show up as lambda invocation errors right because i'm i'm just returning every time so got to make sure that that you do um you know set some alarms on those uh those logs themselves to to look for those errors um in my case the the processing is is really simple um i'm just uh, you know, loading, it's a, it's a JSON record. So I'm loading it and then I'm, you know, reformatting it. I had, uh, I had ambitions of, uh, you know, using Amplify and, and building a, a pretty front end website. But, um, my, my front end skills mean that, that even with great tools like Amplify, I didn't quite have enough time for that. Uh, so yeah. we're, we're basically just gonna, gonna log that out. So let's jump back to. Adam, I just want to just let you know time-wise, we've got about three minutes left. Okay, so cool. um, yeah, we'll see how the stream works on the stream, just to let you know. Yes. And time flies when you're having fun. All right. So just jump over to the CloudWatch logs. And then here's that streaming data coming through. I'm basically printing out that rider uh, ID, the timestamp, and their location in you know north uh, north latitude, uh, north and uh, west. I think is what what that ends up being. Um, so there's our data, you know, all coming through, uh, being pumped in on this side. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there just in case there are, are any more questions. I know we're we're running short on time, uh, but hopefully that was uh, useful. And uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean that is that is super great. I just uh, love the the use case as well. I like a use case where you can sort of understand it. Uh, happy that you riding bikes and it makes sense, particularly with the Tour de France and this other uh, super one down the down the states. So yeah, you've got a producer. So that's your EC2 instance is just pumping the data into into MSK, and you've literally uh, got a um, and you literally got a, a consumer lambda function, and that's just scaling up independently behind the scenes. And at the moment, you're just logging, but you could you know you could be pumping that to anything. You could even be storing it just in S3. You could yep. be, you know, using it for any analytics after that, or you could also be storing some of the data in DynamoDB, pulling it back, back maybe to do some leaderboards or things like that. You know, a whole world of stuff. You a whole world of cool stuff you could build for your uh, for your applications. Totally. Uh, Sahil is just uh, asking, can you just show what the producer oh, uh, sure. file yeah. is? Here we go. Um, so this is the I'm using this Kafka. Uh, you know, library. This is a pretty standard uh, library. Uh, I have a bunch of generic uh, places along the route, and then some GPS IDs. And then the the real um, the the real gist of it is here, right? So here's the the producer. The producer is configured up here in terms of you know what it's using. So uh, you saw in the configuration of my MSK cluster that I had encryption and transit enabled. So you have to, if that's the case, you have to have that security protocol set to SSL. Otherwise, it'll it'll complain that um, you know the broker is the wrong version or connection is the wrong version, something like that. Um, and then. Um, I, you can kind of tell it how to serialize your data. So Kafka doesn't enforce like a specific data type, right? I could send binary data. In my case, you know, I'm encoding things in, in UTF-8, but you could kind of do whatever you want there. Um, but but this is basically setting that as part of that uh, as part of that producer. Um, and then you know to move riders. I basically have a random choice as to whether or not the rider moves in this specific time or not. Uh, and then it creates a, a record with a, a random point. The producer is a, is an async, the send by default is the way I'm doing it here. It's an async send. So there's this callback on send success and callback on error um, so that I can catch those errors Excellent. later. And then after I loop through, we, we flush on out the, uh, um, the producer to make sure all those async calls uh, finish. finish on. 
Adam, thanks so much. We need to run, unfortunately, but uh, I really appreciate you spending the time and having a yeah, super great chat all about MSK and all the cool things you do. Yeah, thank you so much. And Mandikini, who was in, sli in silent mode over there, helping us with the questions, thank you for joining us uh, so much as well. Uh, just quickly before we we're finishing, on to next week, we've got a serverless surprise, and this is a cool new thing with Sam, as uh, Adam was talking about, and this is an, uh, some cool functionality with doing CI, CD with uh, app deployments. So that's on next week. And then the last little thing, anything you want to do with serverless, serverlessland.com, everything to do with serverless at AWS, a cool um, sort of landing page with everything we're doing with serverless at AWS. Adam Mandakini, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for joining us for Serverless Office Hours. And um, Eric Johnson will be your host next week. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. <laughs>